Our, our next speaker is Nathan Yi. Um, Nathan is the leader with Bob Hazen and Shauna Morrison, who's at a NASA panel, but Bob is online. Uh, Bob is at the Carnegie Institute of Washington in Washington, D.C. Um, Carnegie Institute of Science, sorry. Uh, and, and Nathan is a professor uh, in the Department of uh, Environmental Science at Rutgers University. Uh, Nathan got his uh, PhD, uh, he got his undergraduate degree at McGill and his PhD at uh, Notre Dame University. Um, and he is originally a geo person who has over the years uh, become much more interested in bio. And he is the, as I say, the leader of uh, one of the leaders of Team 3. And he is going to talk about the coevolution of nanomachines in the geosphere. Hey, thank you. Take it away, Nathan. Thank you, Paul. So, as Paul mentioned, uh, I'm a geochemist and a geomicrobiologist, and I'm a member of Theme 3 of the Enigma Project. Um, for this year's symposium, I had originally wanted to talk about my recent work on the origin and evolution of the bacterial cell envelope. Um, since my lab was shut down, I've been working with my former PhD student, Jessica Choi, who's now a postdoc at UPenn, and Saroj Boudel on some new ideas on the evolution of cell membranes. So cells are uh, fundamental. Oh, let me just uh, give you a quick announcement before I forget. I just inserted this. Um, one thing I did this year was I established a new minor in astrobiology at Rutgers University. This is now live. Students, at undergraduates in our university can now uh, enroll in this program of study. Uh, along with many of you, we've also taught the first astrobiology course at Rutgers. Uh, this course got a lot of publicity in local newspapers. Um, quick update on that. That course will be now taught in the spring semester. And the good news for you guys is I'll teach that course by myself from now on. Okay. So I wanted to talk about cells in today's uh, seminar, uh, in today's symposium. Um, so as you know, cells are fundamental units of, of all living things. Uh, all proteins used by living things are synthesized inside of cells, and the origin of cells is a central topic in astrobiology. Paul asked me to give a more general overview of minerals and life, so I've, I've pivoted from my original plan slightly. So I'll start by reviewing some basic concepts of, of the cell envelope and energy generation, and then transition to discuss the relationship between cells and minerals. Okay, so here's a textbook diagram of the chemiosmotic reactions involved in the generation of ATP. Uh, electrons are shuttled from central metabolism down electron transport train, and uh, they end up at a terminal electron acceptor. This process continually ejects protons out of the cell. The cell membrane is impermeable to charged ions, and this process creates an electrochemical gradient. There's a membrane-bound enzyme called ATP synthase that transforms the electrochemical gradient into useful cellular energy in the form of ATP. So um, for many years now, I've been interested in this process called the simulatory iron reduction. And here's a slide that I've made for one of my courses. Um, iron is the most abundant chemical element on Earth. Uh, most of it is in Earth's interior but there's still a good amount of iron on the planetary surface. Uh, when iron comes into contact with oxygen, it becomes oxidized, and under oxidizing conditions, iron exists as Fe3 plus ferric iron. Ferric iron has exceedingly low solubility and occurs almost exclusively as a mineral. So in the Earth's crust, uh, there are anaerobic bacteria that don't breathe oxygen. Instead, they breathe ferric iron minerals. Minerals cannot enter cells. So these bacteria have evolved the molecular machinery for, elect for extracellular electron transfer. So what I'm showing here is electrons being shuttled across membranes via these multi-heme C-type cytochromes. Uh, electrons end up uh, in this ferric iron mineral uh, graphite, which I've drawn here as the acicular uh, graphite crystal. So I'm just including these slides to give you my perspective of minerals and microbial life. The research in theme three 
is primarily focused on minerals and protein evolution. So first, what is uh, a mineral? Well, a mineral is a naturally occurring crystalline solid. I think the most important thing to know is that minerals are the source of inorganic elements used by life on Earth. These include um, the metals that you find in metallo proteins. Um, now, minerals cannot enter the cell. So how do metallic elements contained in minerals end up as metal cofactors and metalloenzymes? Well, the answer is simple. The mineral needs to dissolve. The process of breaking down rocks and minerals is called chemical weathering, which I will discuss later in my presentation. Once a mineral dissolves, its crystal structure is obliterated. It is the dissolved ions that enter the cell, not the crystalline solid. All metalloproteins in biology are synthesized inside the cell using dissolved ions as their building blocks. So I've um, studied uh, molybdoenzymes for many years, so I've decided to use molybdenum as an example to illustrate the connection between geochemistry and biochemistry. So shown here on the left is a common molybdenum, molybdenum mineral called molybdenite. It's a molybdenum sulfide mineral. It interacts with molecular oxygen in a geochemical reaction called oxidative weathering, where sulfide in the crystal structure is oxidized to sulfate. Sulfate is soluble and dissolved in water. Simultaneously, the reduced molybdenum in the mineral is oxidized to molybdate, an aqueous oxyanion, and the molybdenum is released from the mineral. The dissolved molyb molybdate then enters the cell, uh, typically through an ABC type transporter in extant microbial life. Now I've um, done some work on the biosynthesis of uh, this molybdenum cofactor known as MOCO. So MOCO is an important cofactor in the active site of uh, this family of enzymes called the DMSO reductase. The structure of DMSO reductase was solved by Douglas Rees at Caltech. That was published in Science, and that paper's been cited hundreds of times. In this slide, I show how molybdenum is inserted into molybdoterin and how molybdoterin is converted into MOCO. And this is the MOCO uh, cofactor in the active site of the DMSO reductase. It's a very busy slide, but the point I want to make is that all metalloproteins on Earth used by living things are synthesized inside of cells using dissolved ions as their substrates for biosynthesis. Now there's been some, you know, I've been teaching this uh, graduate course and there's some, there's some um, confusion between um, prebiotic chemistry and the organ of life that I think we need to clarify. In my mind, what distinguishes between prebiotic chemistry and the origin of life is the containment of chemical activity inside a cell. So life on earth started when we had cells. Once we had cells, we moved past prebiotic chemistry to a world of biochemistry. So one of my research interests is trying to date the age at which this DMSO reductase evolved on earth. So the process that connects the biochemistry to the geochemistry is mineral dissolution. So I'll explain some of my logic and how I try to constrain the age of uh, these molybdoenzymes. Shown here is a simplified uh, diagram of the molybdenum cycle. I'm very proud of this slide um, because my son drew the picture. On top of this beautiful picture, I've added some arrows where I show uh, oxidative weathering of continental crust, where sulfide minerals react with oxygen to produce molybdate. These molybdate oxyanions are then transported by streams and rivers to the ocean, where it's assimilated by marine biota, or it's deposited in sediments and preserved in sedimentary rocks like black shales. Now, just like biochemistry has changed uh, through geologic time, the molybdenum cycle has also changed through geologic time. In fact, there were vast periods of Earth history where no molybdenum in, was found in, in seawater. We know this because black shales preserve a geologic record of seawater molybdenum concentrations. And the current thinking is that atmospheric oxygen is absolutely required to form 
soluble lib date. And that's the central concept in this very famous science paper, uh, a whiff of oxygen before the great oxidation event by Ariel Ombar. Shown on the left is, is a sedimentary sequence known as the McRae Shale in Western Australia. So sedimentary rocks are a record of time. Older rocks are at the bottom, younger rocks are at the top. At 2.5 billion years, there is an molybdenum, molybdenum enrichment found in these black shales, which has been interpreted as a whiff of oxygen that triggered oxidative weathering of continental crust uh, before the GOE. This concept has been expanded by Tim Lyons' group in this nature paper. Uh, this is a plot of molybdenum concentrations as a function of geologic time. The arrow at 2.5 billion years is the whiff of oxygen. Notice there's very little um, molybdenum in older rocks, and then there's an, there are increasing concentrations of molybdenum in the early Proterozoic, but molybdenum didn't jump up until the second big rise in atmospheric oxygen at the beginning of the Phanerozoic. So I think what a useful tool for us to, to use in, um, in our research program is to try to use these sedimentary archives to constrain uh, seawater concentrations of metals found in uh, redox active proteins. Okay, so what are we doing in theme, theme three? Um, Postdoc Jiwa Hao uh, is conducting studies to understand how chemical weathering controls seawater phosphorus concentrations, both on Earth and on other astrobiology targets, such as Enceladus, uh, moon of Saturn. Um, so Jiwa will be giving a talk tomorrow. So uh, I was uh, fascinated by uh, Daniel Sagre's uh, lecture. Um, so an interesting question is whether or not phosphate-free protocells uh, discovered by uh, Daniel, if these protocells are able to self-replicate, so, uh, you know, I, I just want to continue this discussion on what is life? Uh, and can you have life without phosphate? And I, I would be very curious to hear what Jiwa has to say about this topic in his talk tomorrow. So Jiwa is also working uh, with PhD student Winnie Liu on a project that examines uh, oxidative weathering of sulfide minerals. So shown on the left is a plot that I've modified from Eva Stukin's paper with David Catling and Roger Buick. It shows the concentration of sulfur in sedimentary rocks at different ages. And these data serve as a proxy for how much sulfate there was in Archean and Proterozoic seawater. As you can see, there's an increase in seawater sulfate in the Neo-Archean which has been attributed to, the, to a rise in atmospheric oxygen. So I think the data is robust, the data are robust, but I'm pretty sure that interpretation is wrong. Uh, so we have um, some new ideas to explain this record, and it has something to do with cotton formation and the shining of light on land. So Jiwa and Winnie will be conducting some photochemistry experiments to test these new ideas, and I hope to have some exciting results to present to you at next year's symposium. Okay, so uh, I just have one more thing I really wanna get off my chest um, since I've been given extra time, so I just wanna rant a little bit. So I think at Rutgers, we need to do a better job explaining uh, the relevance of our research to NASA, uh, NASA's goals, particularly uh, the NASA astrobiology roadmap and to NASA missions. Well, as you know, NASA is a mission-driven agency, and I think it's critically important for us to explain the relevance of our work to current and proposed NASA missions. So what I'm showing here is a picture of heme. This is a metal coordination structure found in cytochromes, including the ones that enable uh, electron transfer in the stimulatory iron-reducing bacteria, as well as the, uh, the molecule that Vic showed at the beginning of his talk, uh, hemoglobin. So there are no homologs of this coordination complex in mineral structures. Because protein structures are unique and distinct from mineral structures, this enables us to use metalloporphyrins as a biosignature. 
So a quick story. A hundred years ago, there was uh, a debate about the origin of petroleum oil in sedimentary rocks. And many thought that uh, hydrocarbon deposits were geogenic. Then in the 1930s, Alfred Trebs found porphyrins in petroleum oil. And that stunning discovery demonstrated for the first time that hydrocarbon deposits had a biological origin. In fact, we now know that petroleum oil comes from chlorophyll containing marine algae. So with this in mind, I would say the most important upcoming astrobiology mission is Mars 2020. It's a sample return mission that will launch this summer. The rover named Perseverance will land in Jezero Crater, Paleo Lake in the Northern Hemisphere of Mars. Uh, this is an extremely important mission because we already know that there are mudstones on Mars that contain macromolecular organic hydrocarbon. So if NASA scientists discover metalloporphyrins in sedimentary rocks on Mars, just as geochemists have found in sedimentary rocks on Earth, it would be a monumental and historic discovery. Um, so I'm working on a paper that is compiling a list of protein biosignatures, structures that are found in biology that are not found in mineralogy to help guide um, this astrobiology mission. So a preview of what's to come tomorrow. Uh, this research theme three is co-led by Bob Hazen at Carnegie. Um, so Bob has developed a new and revolutionary mineral classification system based on um, natural kind clustering. Um, so he's used natural kind clustering to understand the origin of minerals in the context of planetary evolution. Um, Bob is tremendously productive and I'm uh, eager to hear um, the work he's done in recent months. Okay, so Joy and Shauna have also developed a uh, database uh, that contains both biological and geologic data focusing mainly on terrestrial hot springs and marine hydrothermal vents. In their analysis, they found that there are distinct differences between the microbial communities associated with marine hydrothermal vents compared to volcanic hot springs. So um, Joy will be giving that talk tomorrow. Okay. That's, uh, I only have, that's all I have to say. I'm interested to see if there's any questions. Paul, do you want to uh, move forward to Bamsi's talk, or what do you want to do? do I well, have yeah, now? we have time. We have uh, 10 minutes approximately. So uh, if there are no questions now, we can move on and then have questions at the end of the day. Um, um, I have a, a naive thought. Uh, because when I saw the porphyrin structure, it seems to me that, uh, because I have a colleague who is working on the Mars organic detection, and he show, she showed me um, uh, yesterday uh, her slides about some possible organic carbon on Mars. And I remember that there are also some uh, like carbon nitrogen rich heavy organics uh, detected in the subsurface ocean of the Enceladus. So I'm thinking, you know, if uh, in in those environment, if we can have both the organic rich, uh, like both the heavy carbon plus some metals, is that possible to form the porphyrin structure or our enzymes abiotically? Yeah, I think um, you know porphyrin structures are unique to biology. That's what's been known so far. Uh, in decades, century of research. So I don't think you can form these, these structures abiotically. Okay, so even if, I mean, maybe some similar, like maybe form some uh, combined uh, um, like metal proteins and then uh, have similar function, but maybe not so complicated like, like, like uh, biologically um, porphyrin. Like, is that possible or? 
Yeah, so you know, in we can we can discuss this more, Jua. Um, but we can we can think about all the abiotic structures we can form through metal coordination with ligands, mm. and then um, look at how biology makes those structures we found we find in metal cofactors. Um, you know, the plot I showed about the molybdenum parent and the molybdenum um, cofactor, the MOCO cofactor. What I wanted to show was that it's a very complicated choreographed process mm. that leads to the formation of these structures. That's why um, they're unique to biology. Okay. Without those complicated steps, I just don't think you can generate um, those types of structures. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So this idea has been around for a very long time. Sam Granick, uh, I think, started this issue that uh, when he was a, what would have been a postdoc, they really didn't call them postdocs in the days of uh, uh, Michaelis, of Michaelis-Menten equation at Rockefeller University. And he spent his entire career studying porphyrins, their evolution, and then David Mazaral uh, started and continued for many years on the evolution of porphyrins. And they wrote many papers, well, at least Mazarel did, in Origins of Life and the Evolution of Porphyrins, and that porphyrins were a biosignature. Um, but I want to ask Daniel, Daniel Segre, are you still around? Yes, yes. So it's the, we have many, many meteorites that um, have bizarre amino acids, uh, but most of them are relatively irrelevant. Um, you know, 20, 30, you've got 20 uh, uh, carbon chains. Okay, so but so the alanine glycine series, that's, you know, you can find them in, 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 in meteorites. We don't see, at least as far as I know, cysteine and histidine. Um, in your seed pathways, I think you'll need, at least in biology, those two amino acids uh, to get you to, from pyruvate outwards. How, how would you, can you generate cysteine and histidine in a seed way? Um, let me see, I have to double check. Um, and I don't know if- So this is another biosignature that's being yeah. looked at very carefully, for example, uh, for Europa mm -hmm. now. Uh, I, I, I will check and... Okay, we'll talk to you later. Uh, I, I noticed, uh, this is Doug, um, I noticed that cysteine is actually near uh, serine and glycine in, in Daniel's map. Wow. Yes, 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 it is here. Um, yes. So then you can make, a, you, you, you can make a, a, a very simple complex of amino acids that with with cysteine, if we have cysteine, we can we can make uh, the four iron, four sulfur group that is common in ferrodoxins, which is cysteine XX, cysteine XX, cysteine, and then another fourth cysteine further down the road. So we're binding it with four cysteines. So cysteine is uh, the biological equivalent of hydrogen sulfide um, from deep sea vents but it allows the the iron to go undergo catalytic oxidation reduction it's it's a very interesting problem of histidine and cysteine if if we you know, if we can find either or both of those amino acids yeah. on mars or 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 uh, they're not going to be preserved but if they were in europa that would be great. I mean, the problem with Mars is the regolith is extraordinarily, extraordinarily oxidizing. So even bringing onto a, a rover the mudstones and trying to find the amino, uh, the the uh, organics that would be there is going to be is very, very difficult. And Mars twenty twenty doesn't have a mass spectrometer on it. No, it does have Raman. I think they're going to use the Raman as no, the primary use tool to look for organics. The, the um, major, major tool is a drill core. No. Okay, so they're going to leave samples to be returned to Earth later. But, you know, I, I, I guess if they can find with the Raman, uh, 
on the regolith, and if they scrape the regolith and see in, underneath, if they can see some evidence of the porphyrins, uh, that would be super great. I mean, obviously, they're driving this by searching for life uh, on ancient Mars, which is amazing if they can find it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quickly look, looking at the chat. I think um, Eli wants to explain to us how co uh, this cobalt coal factor is made. Eli, do you want to chime in? Oh, I didn't have a ton to say. I just wanted to say I had read that in other, other literature that uh, with the right types of precursors, cobalamine, which is a porphyrin-like structure um, in vitamin B12, can be synthesized abiologically. I'll, I'll, I'll have to go back and find that. Do you, that you need biological precursors? Uh, what is it? You need the... Uh, cyclic uh, nitrogen containing cyclic compounds. Um, so <clears throat> it's not the simplest precursors, but I'll go back and look for that. But that's just- Interesting if you can make it completely apologically from the starting material, the seed material that Daniel uses in his analysis. Absolutely, yeah. 